Texas relays are back in action. Texas, Texas baseball keeps rolling, but have some bumps on the road. And the madness continues in women's basketball. All this and more coming up on College Press Box. Good evening and welcome to College Press Box. I'm your host, Debbie Serta, and she's Ezra Chameleon. And we got a great show for you this evening, so let's get right into it. We first start off this episode of College Press Box with t Texas Track and Field. This past weekend, it was the 90 95th Clyde Littlefield Texas Relays, and we have our very own Robert Gonsing to break it down for us. Take it away, Robert. Thank you, Edley and Debney. The Texas Relays are known by many of the sports enthusiasts as the Disney World of all track meets. Well, this weekend's turnout of events surely lived up to the name in the 95th version of the meet. Teams like Texas, Ole Miss, Georgia, uh, all shined while individual athletes from other schools also excelled. Let's jump right into the action to see how it all went down. It was an action-packed weekend of track and field in Austin, Texas, as UT hosted their annual Clyde Littlefield Texas Relays, where the top collegiate and high school athletes from all across the country gathered at Mike A. Myers Stadium and Soccer Field to showcase their talent in the finals on Saturday. It was an impressive day, to say the least, as collegiate and meet records were broken all over. The afternoon kicked off with the women's 4x100 meter relay finals, where Texas's team of Julian Alfred, Azeen Abba, Lene Thomas, and Kavana Davis brought home the gold, running a time of 42 flat and setting a new collegiate and meet record. It was a big day for Texas's women's team overall, as they almost nearly set another record in the 4x400 meter relay. Over on the men's side, LSU and Iowa battled it out in a neck and neck race, but it would end up being LSU's team of Brandon Hicklin, Dorian Kamel, Demarcus Fleming, and Godson Ogenbroom coming in, in first with a time of 38.53 seconds. LSU! There were also many stellar performances and individual events that had fans applauding. In the men's 100-meter dash, Isaiah Trousel of Northern Iowa won first by just .01 seconds as Alabama's Tarsus Oregot would be right behind him. Both, both sprinters ran times of 10.16 and 10.17 seconds, respectively. And sprinter Mackenzie Long from Ole Miss showed up to perform by winning the 100-meter dash with an 11-second flat time in her senior season. After the race, she mentioned that part of her successes going forward is believing in herself and not getting distracted from outside pressures. Um, honestly, just... Keep telling myself that I belong here, you know, and just perform, really. Like, I don't want any kind of pressure on myself and just do what I can do best and just showcase the world who I am. But the impressiveness of the meets athletes continued to show to the very end as the day concluded with very exciting 4x400 meter relay races in both divisions. In the men's division, it was an SEC battle throughout the entire race as Georgia and Alabama fought for the lead. Fans were excited to watch Georgia's impressive team of Elijah Godwin, Matthew Bowling, Caleb Cavanaugh, and Will Sumner. Just as Alabama took the lead in the final lap, Sumner started kicking in in the final 100 meters, which secured the gold for the Bulldogs. Georgia ended up running a time of 2 minutes and 58.82 seconds and setting a new Texas Relays record. In the women's division, Texas dominated the entire race as they were looking to break the meet record they set last year in 2022. Rachel Elbing, Julian Alfred, Kennedy Simon, and Rosida Adelecki led Texas to dominating the entire race in a first place finish. Their time was 3 minutes 23.27 seconds, just less than a second shy of beating their previous record. It was a successful day of track and field that had fans on their feet and in awe of all the talented athletes in front of them. From Mike A. Myers Stadium reporting for TSTV Sports, I'm Robert Gonsolin. It's tough to say who was the most impressive athlete from all the performances this past week, so I don't want to sing out anyone, but I really have to hand it to all the Texas women's relay teams. However, one athlete who really caught my eye this past weekend was sprinter Julian Alfred. She was the anchor leg on the 42-second uh, 4 4x1 team that set a new collegiate and meet record. On top of that, she was the second leg on their 4x4 that came up short of beating their relay uh, rec record from last year. And we cannot forget about the 4 by 200 meter relay. Who could be running on this team? You guessed it, Julian Alfred. This team ran a time of 1 minute and 28.05 seconds and brought home another collegiate record on Saturday. All three of these times make the te Texas the current fastest women's 4 by one 4 by 2 
and 4x4 relay teams in the entire country. Without sprinters like Alfred, Texas would have a very tough time making up for the records that they have already set. Furthermore, as the team gets closer to the Big 12 and NCAA championships, it will be fellow it will be up to fellow relay teammates Angela and Alfred to stay as prepared as possible and also healthy in order for them to uh, excel at the best level that they can. The Texas Relays are an awesome event, but head coach Edric Florian would sure rather have his best athletes ready and more, important, more importantly, just well prepared for meets coming up. Thanks so much for that analysis, Robert. When we come back, we'll talk about OSU Cowboys snapping the Texas baseball 16th streak. So, and you don't want to miss it. We'll be right back. into College Press Box. Now we hit to Stillwater where the Longhorns came short in the second and third game. Friday night, Dylan Campbell opened up with a triple. As you can see, Nolan McClendon struggled to pick up the ball with the result of this hit. He went on to go three for three to five to the plate, almost completing the circuit, just missing a home run. Marcus Brown would go down the line as Jared Thompson would pick it up and send it to Mitchell Daly. He hesitates a little and then chunks it in to prevent another scored run. As OSU gets on the board, Garrett Gilmet launched one onto center field, bringing it one and one. McClendon then launched one over on the center field of Lucas Gordon, bringing the game five to two. The Longhorns would continue to make would continue to make it 16 wins before it would all go downhill on Saturday. Texas would drop game two and open up with Gilmet's home run on Sunday that was sent to left field. Carson Banks would send another one to Dylan Campbell for quite the out at home plate. And then Texas would go 3-0. As you can see right here, Dylan just launches that one in and sends it for the quite the out. OSU with a big barrel from, from Chase Atkinson launching it onto the left field right by the foul pole, bringing it 3-2. As you can see, everyone thinks it's out. And then, boom, he just hits it on the foul pole, making it a home run. OSU was trailing 3-2. Zane Morehouse would then have a pitching error, loading the bases for Bredman Holt to steal home. As things could not get worse for Texas, a walk-off single drive down the line for Nolan Schubert that would bring the final score 3-4. to four. Then Texas would just absolutely lose that game. They would drop it on the first, snapping in. Texas would drop its first Big 12 series, and the winning streak was nowhere to be found. I'd like to welcome in b baseball analyst Joseph Duffy. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be here, Deb. Of course. So Texas rode into enemy's territory to face the Aggies. In College Station, how was Texas able to come away with such a big win? Well, first, Deb, it was Texas' hot start to begin the game in the top of the first inning. Downtown Porter Brown was able to knock in Dylan Campbell and Peyton Powell with that two RBI double in left center in rivalry games, especially sorry in rivalry games, especially on the road. Quick offensive starts can catapult a team. Though Texas only scored five runs in the ball game, their bats proved to be hot with 15 hits on the day. Five players having multi-hit days, and Eric Kennedy having himself a four-hit affair. Also, Deb, the pitching was stellar for the Longhorns in this game. It was clear that this game was going to be a bullpen performance where LeBaron Johnson would be the, uh, the opener for the day. And he would have three innings of work while Zane Morehouse would close the door with three strikeouts in the ninth. The turnaround for this Texas team has started with the pitching staff, which has the best combined ERA in all of the Big 12 Conference. Now, because of this joint effort, it was goodbye to A&M for Texas' 15th straight win snapping their four-game losing streak against the Aggies and his first win in College Station since 2012. No, the environment there was absolutely great. Great vibes all around. I imagine so, yeah. Definitely. So we all knew the turnarounds would eventually face some obstacles. So what went wrong for the Longhorns at Stillwater and in resulting into getting their win streak snapped on Saturday? Yeah, Deb, it's sad the streak ended, but we knew that this great streak would last forever as Texas would drop their last two games in the series against OSU, snapping the longest streak in the nation. Now, look, the offense just wasn't clicking in games two and three. In game two, Oklahoma State's pitching staff would strike out Texas 14 times. That, of course, by the Big 12 strikeout leader, Warren Watts-Brown, and the Big 12 ERA leader, 
and possibly the best closer in all of the Big 12 Conference, Isaac Stavins, closing the game for the Pokes. Now, the pitching staff for Texas would remain consistent, which is a great sign, but Texas would only have four hits in game two. In game three, pitching was once again stellar, but the lead was blown in the ninth, as you just saw, after three walks led to a walk-off winner from Nolan Schubert against a shaky Zane Morehouse. Now, pitching has done their job for the bulk of this turnaround, but once again, the offense was quite stagnant in this game. During Texas's 16-game win streak, the offense was averaging 8.1 runs a game. If this offense wants to seriously contend after a significant talent drop-off from the, from the College World Series roster last year, offense is going to have to be more consistent in the long run. No, I definitely agree. You know, last year we had such a stellar, strong offense. With this year losing some of those stars like Ivan Melendez, we definitely need to stop making those errors when it's so easy. Absolutely. Now, Joe, after Texas dropped two straight games after winning, after snapping its 16-game streak, what does the rest of their schedule embody and what does it look like for them? You know, Deb, I really think that Texas will be fine in this conference. They've proven that their starting pitching can be relied on. I'm curious to see, though, how this team responds to adversity after dropping such close games that they had very good opportunities to win. On the bright side, the Longhorns are still atop the Big 12. But most of all, it is best that while their pitching has maintained, the offense has struggled. All you can ask for from pitching, your pitching staff and defense is that they give you a chance to win the game. And that wasn't the case for Texas early in the season at all. If you remember, Texas had eight errors in their first three games of the season and gave up 21 runs combined in those losses. Texas has turned that around to have the best ERA in the Big 12 Conference, as previously stated, but they've also had the third least errors in the conference. Defensive miscues and sloppy pitching will never give an offense a chance to win. So I believe that as the season progresses, Texas can still compete in a season that the Longhorn faithful and critics did not expect for them in the first place. Texas is about to return to the dish where they are, they've only lost twice in the whole season, and they're going to face an Air Force team that has struggled mightily all year. What better opportunity to get back in the winning column than on Tuesday? I definitely agree. I love Air Force team because they just have such – they're so composed, great team for every to come out to the dish. Absolutely. Once they get the ball rolling, they're definitely going to be a stronger force to come with. Thank you so much for that analysis, Joe. We definitely need to clean up a little bit of those errors, and we'll be right back on track, sending it back to Edley at the desk. Thank you for that analysis, Joseph. When we come back, Rowan Brentford will talk about Women's March Madness Championship. Iowa versus LSU. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back to College Press Box. Women's March Madness concluded yesterday with a matchup no one had planned. Rowan Benford is here to talk a little bit more on the NCAA championship. I would like to welcome in our Women March Madness analyst, Rowan Brentford. Thank you for joining us tonight, Rowan. Thank you for having me. The LSU Tigers toppled the Iowa Hawkeyes in the NCAA Women's Championship Sunday. Break it down for break out break down the game more for viewers at home. Well, the Tigers were firing on all cylinders, beating the Hawkeyes 102 to 85, scoring the most points ever in a women's title game. The Tigers' hot outside shooting led to a 17-point halftime lead, and the Hawkeyes came out responding strong in the third quarter, cutting it down to only eight points, but LSU held on and got the victory. The win was a result of well-rounded play. LSU outshot Iowa with a team field goal percentage of 54 and a three-point percentage of 65%. LSU outdefended Iowa, getting more steals and causing 16 turnovers, and LSU out-rebounded Iowa 36 to 26, with 14 offensive boards resulting in 14 second chance points. Angel Reese broke the NCAA single season record for most double doubles in Saturday's win and was awarded NCAA's most outstanding player award. She had 15 points, 10 rebounds, five assists, three steals, and one block. Other notable performances came from LSU's Jasmine Carson and Alexis Morris. Carson, coming off the bench, led LSU with 22 points in as many minutes. Morris came in a, second, in a close second with 21 points, 15 of which came in the second half, fending off the Iowa comeback that was mounting at the time. 
Caitlin Clark had a game high of 30 points, but a rough outing otherwise. She also had four fouls, six turnovers, and 30 of those points came on just nine of 22 shooting. The game wasn't without its controversy. Angel Reese taunted Caitlin Clark and some found, found it and poor found some found poor fouling calls created a quite a bit of buzz. What's your thoughts on this these issues? Well, I'll start with Reese's taunt. Yeah. She hit Clark with John Cena's "You Can't See Me" taunt and um, her ring celebration. Oh yes, and then pointed towards the ring right at the end of the game whenever it was well secured. Some people are labeling this as classless. Personally. I see absolutely nothing wrong with it. Yeah. This is sports. There's taunting. These are competitors who are trying their hardest, and they don't like each other. So it makes sense that they would, you know, talk trash, taunt one another. There's nothing wrong with it. Taunting makes these games more interesting. It builds bad blood, and Reese's actions are only good for sports in general. Not to mention, she was only doing that particular taunt because Clark had done the very same thing against Louisville. I also think that there is a large difference in response towards what Clark did versus what Reese did online, and it's, indi and it's indicative of certain biases that people might hold. But I digress now onto the refs, which I think that there is a legitimate gripe against in, for Iowa fans. I wanted the first part of this segment to just focus on how the teams played because that is what won LSU the game. They had a great game. Iowa did not. But the refs had an outsized role in the outcome. They called nearly 40 personal fouls, almost a foul a minute, 19 on Iowa and 18 on LSU. Two of Iowa's starters in McKenna Warnock and Monica Cisano, apologies for the mispronunciation, fouled out on what were frankly soft calls, but the most egregious one came actually on Caitlin Clark, who picked up a tech for tossing a basketball behind her. Hmm. It was, um, the official explanation was that Clark, quote, failed to immediately pass the ball to the nearest official after the whistle had blown, which resulted in a delay of game. Ultimately, I think that this was just the referees feeling the pressure of the spotlight that was on them, given the fact that this is the biggest game in women's uh, in women's college basketball. I agree, and they had like 9.9 .9 viewers watching this game. I mean, this is this is such like a great growth for women's sports, but. What about the bar in the tournament? Who was the best players that came out of this whole March Madness? Well, it's not going to surprise many, but the best players ended up playing in the very final game. First, I'll talk about Caitlin Clark, who was the consensus choice for the best player in the tournament. She came in first in Division I assists and three-pointers, and second in scoring average with multiple logo, th logo threes. She can stretch the floor, make good reads, and she carved up defenses on her way to that championship game. You don't win the Associated Press's Women's Basketball Player of the Year and the Wade Award for nothing. So Caitlin Clark, she had a great tournament. Who else had a great tournament? Unsurprisingly, Reese did. Um, Angel, Angel Reese, that is. Reese averaged 21.3 points and 15.3 rebounds en route to leading the Tigers to a national championship and was awarded with the Most Outstanding Player Award, which is typically given to the best player on the winning team. Finally, the best player in the tournament, not actually in the championship game, was Aaliyah Boston. She was an imposing defender, probably the best in women's college basketball this season. She averaged 13 points, 9.7 rebounds, and led her team to the Final Four. Her dominant play has her projected to be the number one pick in the upcoming WNBA class. Well, it's been a great March Madness for women, and when we head and we head back to the desk with Deb. Thank you so much for that analysis, Ronan. When we return, we will recap everything that happened at Texas Sports this upcoming week. Welcome back into College Press Box. Number one rowing team competes in San Diego Crew Classic and wins with four sweeps. Number nine slash eight softball traveled up to Norman for the classic 
for the classic Red Rebel rivalry, hoping to take one away from the Sooners. OU, in fact, did not suck as they swept Texas in three with the final score ending 10-2 on Sunday. Number nine's women's tennis team plays number 33 Texas Tech and wins 4-0. Number one, men's tennis takes down number 39, the Oklahoma Sooners, with the score ending 6-1. to one. Texas was able to sweep both Oklahoma teams, OU and OSU, this past weekend to kick off conference play. Taking a look into ahead to Longhorns, <laughs> a week ahead in Longhorn sports. Wednesday, volleyball versus ba Texas volleyball versus Baylor at 7.30, uh, Texas... Thursday, softball at Iowa State at 4 p.m. at ESPN+. Plus. Men's, men's tennis at Texas Tech, 5 p.m. Baseball versus Kansas State, 6.30 p.m. at Longhorn Network. Friday, softball, softball at Iowa State at, at 4 o'clock on ESPN+. Plus. And baseball versus Kansas State, 6.30 on Longhorn Network. Saturday, baseball versus Kansas State, 12 p.m. on Longhorn Network. Softball at Iowa State at 1 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. And men's tennis at Baylor, 6 p.m. That'll wrap things up for this week's episode of College Press Box. Make sure to tune into our other shows this week, concluding College Crossfire on Wednesday and the 1-0 Sports on Friday. Thank you to our analysts, everyone in the Master Control Room, our executive producer, Samantha Pearl, and everyone else here at TSTV. I'm Debbie Serna, and she's Edley Termillion. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a good night.